Good afternoon, everyone, for another installment of the Land Use and Ethics Subcommittee. We're going to be continuing our discussion this afternoon on House Bill 538, which we talked about for the second time yesterday, and we went through a new reprint. We've got a couple of new, um, a couple of small uh, and maybe a couple of big amendments to discuss today that came out of our really productive and I think really thorough discussion yesterday. And I think some of you will see your fingerprints on some of these amendments that we're going to talk through. Um, I, I'm hoping this is not going to go quite as long as last time because we don't have quite as much to discuss, but I also want to make sure everyone totally understands what we're voting on. So um, we can jump right into the reprint. I'm going to ask Colleen to throw that up on the screen share. And we're just going to kind of jump. We're not going to go through the whole bill again. We're just going to kind of jump through the new parts of the bill that um, are new as of today. So the first one is the definition of mixed use. So we can scroll down to the definitions. This is something that we talked through yesterday. I remember a number of you raised this. Delegate Naraki, I think most memorably, raised this. And here we go. Here's our new definition. We approved it one conceptually yesterday. And Ben, we've got to thank him again for all of his hard work on this. He pushed this out in record time. We've got mixed use now, meaning a combination of a residential use with a recreational office, dining, or retail use. And in the next line, you can see mixed use does not mean any combination of a residential use with an industrial or hazardous use. So that is the sort of the two-part cleanup there that we had. I'm going to jump down, assuming we don't have any questions on that. It's pretty self-explanatory. I think the next part that we'll go through is down to the uh, transit-oriented development part. We are actually bumping up the radius back from, we had discussed last week, or not last week, yesterday, we had discussed 0.5. Um, and yeah, you can see here, we're actually moving that up to 0.75, three quarters of a mile. So the bill came in as applying to one mile. We brought, we halved it. And then as part of this discussion around that additional amendment we talked about with the single family zoning, there were some more conversations with various stakeholders in the last 24 hours. The result of which is that we're going to move that back up to 0.75 um, from 0.5. Uh, but what I will say on this piece is I think this issue about what happens with single family zoning in transit oriented neighborhoods is still a very hot button one with a lot of different feelings and a lot of different views on each side. And so what I would say is I would not be shocked if this section ends up being somewhat different after the bill goes through maybe a conference committee or depending on what the Senate does to it. So this is the version we're going to roll with for now um, in this reprint, but I would not be shocked if there are additional changes made to this section. I just wanted to give everyone a heads up about that. Um, the next one will go down to the public meeting section. Um, this is not, I think, in this version of the reprint has not been adjusted, but I'm going to, if the subcommittee will allow me, I'm going to do just kind of a conceptual amendment. I was going to have Ben draft this before full committee and adopt it tomorrow in full committee, but I think it may just be a little bit cleaner because it's so self-explanatory. We got a couple of flags that when you have this list of, of uh, venues for public meetings here, that really no one ever needs more than one meeting in the an either a historic district commission or a board of appeals meeting. Yes, you might need multiple meetings at, uh, you know, before your local governing body or before your local planning commission. And so we're going to still limit those to two, but we're going to we're going to bifurcate this. And and so what I'd like to do is just a conceptual amendment right now and just kind of incorporate this into over the one big amendment vote here. And well, so what this amendment will say is no more than two public meetings before the local governing body and the local planning commission, but no more than one meeting at a historic district commission or historic preservation commission and the board of appeals. So that caps the total meeting. Instead of capping the total meetings at eight, it caps the total meetings at six, which I think is still a pretty big number. But we just heard from folks that basically the, the amount of times that projects need to have multiple meetings at either a historic district or a board of appeals are so minimal that um, it's kind of overkill to allow two in this section for these preferred projects that are qualified. Delegate Foley. Okay, so I see it says that a local government may not require. Yeah, um, more and than. So our, our anticipation is, I just want to be clear on this because this is a little confusing to me. So 
yeah, our anticipation several double negatives. Yeah, it has several double negatives. So, so what this means is you don't have to have any hearings at any at any of these. Exactly. Although presumably you would have some, right? Um, yeah. But you certainly don't have to have it at all of these, right? Yeah. Exactly. So it just it depends on what the local government requirements are. Is that correct? Exactly. So the local okay. government could require way less than this. Okay? They could require zero or one. They could go under this all they want. We're just saying, what's the maximum amount of public hearings that we really need to have? Because we want to have public hearings, theoretically. You know, Local governments generally like to do these. We want the public to weigh in, certainly. At the same time, at a certain point, they become repetitive and they impose costs and uncertainty to worthwhile projects. And so this it came in as basically capping it at four. We got feedback to say like, well, on certain projects, especially in certain sensitive areas, that may not be enough. Uh, so we came up with eight because that was just kind of a simple amendment. Let's just go from one to two. Easy enough. Everyone can understand that. But now we've heard more feedback that it would be kind of absurd to allow jurisdictions to have three appeals meetings. Why would you need to have three appeals meetings? You know, so so we're going to bifurcate this. So one and two here are going to be capped at two. Local jurisdictions can go under or they can skip one of the four. They don't have to touch each base, you know, first, second, third and home. They don't have to touch all the bags. They can they can just touch one or two. And then three and four are going to be capped at one. Okay, conceptually, thanks. if we approve the amendment. OK, thank you. Delegate Bullitt. All right. So that's that. Uh, and then we'll move down to the next change, which is that it actually we can't move down to it. We can just hold here. It's not in the bill anymore. So we actually that we have nothing to scroll to. But you guys will may remember that there was some language around public utilities and master meters that was sort of thrown into the bill briefly that I talked about yesterday. Um, the goal of this was sort of to address the high cost of utilities, especially for missing middle housing. And that's why it was added. However, it did engender some pushback in the last 24 hours. So rather than sort of make this more complicated and throw something in that we didn't hear about in the public hearing, we decided just to take that out. So it was it was only in the bill for like 24 hours. So I, I doubt there will be any like tears or consternation, but we we have taken that out. So you'll see when we send over the reprint of this to all the interested parties, you'll see that that section has been struck. What, what we can scroll down to is the next big change, and it's the very end of the bill. And that's that you'll see that the entire APFO section of this bill has been struck. Now, let me explain this a little bit because I think there's some strong feelings on all sides of this issue as well. Um, this bill came in with a, an APFO provision that was conceptually separate from the rest of the provisions. There's been a lot of conflation that somehow the three qualified projects also had some sort of APFO contingency. That's not true. The way the bill came in is all these qualified projects are eligible for expedited development review and density bonuses and lots of good stuff. And then totally separately, you know, period, 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 new paragraph, uh, indention. Also, if you have a state or federal funded project that APFO could not be used, the adequate public facility ordinances that some of our local jurisdictions have could not be used as a veto mechanism for state funded or federal funded projects. Now, there are only about 30 of these types of projects that get approved every year or so. Um, these are like LIHTC projects that run through DHCD. We're not talking about a ton of them, but essentially the intent of the governor's office was, well, for these projects that the, that the state has put their stamp of approval on, and of there, there are not that many of them, but we want to prioritize, we're not going to let local governments use APFO against these projects. That was the original intent. We worked with Delegate Guyton, who was kind of a stand-in for, I think, a lot of people that had concerns about this section, including at the hearing, to instead say that you could, uh, jurisdictions could use APFO if a particular cluster or school boundary was overcrowded. And so that was the amendment we talked through yesterday, with, to basically say that they could still preserve that APFO veto if the capacity of the school was 100% or greater. Since then, there have been a lot of conversations and actually a, a, sort of a consensus formed to just strike this section entirely because both sides had concerns about having a 100% capacity issue in there. Because on the one hand, people that um, are worried about school capacity and worried about new housing jacking up school numbers, they raised concerns, including Delegate Guyton, raised concerns that, well, some jurisdictions, maybe they're only at 90 or 95%, but if you approve a bunch of housing at one time, they're very quickly going to sail over 100%. On the other hand, we heard from folks um, that would like to see more housing um, 
uh, and maybe are not as concerned about the school capacity issues that said, well, because there's so much conflation around this issue of APFO uh, with the other provisions of the bill, it it's, gets confusing and people are taking the wrong signal from it. So everyone sort of agreed that, that the cleaner thing to do here would be to strike this section and to come back next year, either as an administration DCD bill, or maybe it's going to be a chair Stewart bill or a delegate Guyton bill. I don't know. I don't know who's going to have this bill, but to sort of tackle this APFO, um, APFO provision separately next year. So this is essentially like a new Guyton amendment. Um, instead of, of doing a 100%, we're just striking the entire section. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah, Delegate Foley. No, okay, she's- Yes, she's I do. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. I, um, so this means that APVO could be used to deny like any one of these projects. Is that right? That's right. The status quo under APVO, some provisions have it, some of them don't. But the by striking this section, we're doing nothing to change existing APVO law whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Delegate Lehman. Okay, I, I think you just answered the question. So by striking this now, you're talking about leaving the door open to a, you know, sort of a better, for lack of a of a of a of a different term, a, approach to how to balance um adequate public facilities requirements, local control, and all of those things. But in the meantime, that none of the none of this applies the usual standards that each individual you know county um uh you know measure they use for emergency response time school overcrowding adequate you know sewer you know road capacity whatever will it, it's as is nothing changes couldn't have said it better myself delegate layman that's exactly okay. right i mean essentially okay. the conclusion that we came to is that people have really strong opinions on this at all sides you know some people think that apfo is an extremely useful tool for local jurisdictions to make sure their schools aren't overcrowded and we don't have trailers running amok on the other hand people other you know people think that apfo is an illegitimate tool for local jurisdictions sometimes to block housing that they just don't want, you know, more housing, or they don't want poor people living in their neighborhood, or they don't want a variety of things that maybe are less legitimate, and they use APFO inappropriately as a tool to achieve those ends. And we right. heard from all of those people, not only in the last 24 hours, but over the last several weeks. And the, essentially, the conclusion we've come to is, rather than do this in a haphazard way, after crossover, in this limited time timeline, trying to like, figure out this really, really big issue. We heard from a lot of folks yesterday, subcommittee meeting, which is a great discussion from members of the subcommittee, rather than trying to tap, you know, tackle this really, really complicated issue where there are strong feelings on so many sides in this limited window that we have as part of a larger bill that's not really otherwise related to it, it makes more sense to just sever this, focus on what the governor has otherwise put ahead of us and worry about this issue in a future session. Right. Good, good summary. Thank you. I'll be interested to see going forward what we do with this. But thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you, Delegate Lehman. Delegate Naraki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to point a, a broader point of clarification, if I may. So how does APFO then work in the other parts of the bill? Uh, can, can an APFO be used with respect to the other, the transitory development part and, you know, the other parts of the bill? Or how does that work? I'm just trying to wrap my brain around this whole bill. There's, you know, a lot of moving parts here. Yes, yes. So the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, it was actually never intended to change how APFO works in the other parts of the bill. And that's where that confusion and conflation started to arise. People, I think, have, have reached out under the the you know untrue assumption, but I get why they came to this, because it's a little confusing, that this section of the bill, they thought had some sort of other broader applicability, and that, for example, we were going to limit the use of APFO if you were near transit, you know, or limit the use of APFO if you were a nonprofit, right? And that was actually never the intent, but I can see why that confusion started to creep in, creep in. And so by striking this, part of what we're doing here, rather than just kind of putting this discussion off to a, a different and a better time, is just trying to tamp down on that confusion by just saying, whatever the rules are in your local jurisdiction around APVO today, if we pass this bill, they will remain the same. And, and Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, one other question. Of course. Um, so how, uh, assuming we the, the committee de decides to go down that route, the other amendment that we spoke about yesterday, the, the single family designation, how does that apply to all the different uh, parts of the, the bill as well, just to understand that also? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, 
So we're keeping the single family uh, piece in there for now. Like I said, I think the Senate may go a different direction. And by the time this bill ends up on the governor's desk, maybe that section will look differently. But right now, the, the reprint in front of you says that if you're a single family zone, yeah, we can scroll to that section if you want, Colleen. Yeah, if, you, if you're a single family zone neighborhood as of January 1, 2024, um, then these um, transit-oriented development pieces within 0.7 miles of a transit stop, those don't apply to you. You're not preempted. Okay. So we're preser we're trying to, what we're trying to do here with the 0.75 and keeping this language in is again to just kind of split the baby a little bit. Sure. Preserve, you know, basically we hear concerns from people that want to preserve the character of single-family neighborhoods, and that's why this language is in. But at the same time, we want to try to nudge jurisdictions to allow density in the one place where everyone agrees we've got to have it, which is near transit. When we don't allow higher density near transit, that's when sprawl develops. And that's where buildings start to creep in in areas where our infrastructure really cannot support it. And so that's why we want to make sure that, that near all of our high frequency transit stops, we get as much housing as possible because we got to we got to put it somewhere and that's the best place for it. But at the same time, we're trying to be sensitive to concerns of people who have single family, have, you know, longstanding single family neighborhoods that are reasonably close to transit and that don't necessarily want, you know, huge towers erected next to them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that clarification. Yep, absolutely. OK, and then the, seeing no other hands on this on the app, though, we can go back to app, though, seeing no other hands now that we've sort of exhausted that. The only other change in this reprint versus what you saw yesterday is that we did move the implementation date, the effective date, back to January 1, 2025, based on concerns from MAKO and some other entities just around needing more time to sort of digest this and stomach it. And so we're pushing that back to January 1, 2025. And that's it. That's the reprint. I can't promise that I maybe I won't have like one or two stray things to say in full committee tomorrow. But as far as we know, this is the reprint for right now. Tell you fully. Oh, Mr. Chair, if there are no more questions, I'd like to move the bill as amended. Second. Well, we got to move the amendments first, but oh. I'll, I'll assume. Oh, sorry. I meant to say that. I moved the amendments. Okay. Second. All right. All right. In a second. Okay, great. Any other discussion on the amendments? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendments here, please raise your hand or signify by saying aye. 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 All right, great. And we're going to include the reprint as well as that one conceptual piece around the public hearing as far as that one vote, but that's all we're voting on. All right, any any final remarks on the bill as amended? Move the bill as amended. Second. second. All right, the full bill as amended has been moved and seconded. Any last chance, last chance bite at the apple for now to make any further comments? Delegate Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to just very briefly thank you for all of your hard work on, on this, all of the stakeholders. So kudos to you. Appreciate that, Delegate Long. And I want to, I'll send it right back at you guys. I think we had a great discussion yesterday. We've had a great discussion today. You know, I, I think not everyone is going to be thrilled with every different part of this, whether in this subcommittee or the full committee or on the floor or in the Senate. But we're trying to, I think, move the ball forward on a really important issue. And we're trying to do it in a balanced way. And we're trying to do it with a lot of interested stakeholders at the table. Delegate Naraki. Mr. Chair, I just also uh, want to echo Delegate Long's uh, comments there. I want to thank you for all your work. Clearly, there's been a lot of work in this. I appreciate also you allowing me to hold the bill for a day just to kind of have some more time to, to digest it. And I think hopefully it helped all of us to kind of figure some things out here. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to vote for the bill, but I, I do appreciate all the work that has has gone into this, Mr. Chair. So thank you. Appreciate that. And yeah, no, I think the hold ended up being advantageous. I think it really allowed us to sort of sit with us, all of us collectively, and make these kind of last second amendments here that I think did improve the bill. Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> excuse me to um, echo Delegate Long. Thank you for the... Um, you know, hard work, the thoughtful work. And I think, you know, in my mind, this um, is the epitome of the definition of consensus, which is, can you live with this bill? And I think, you know, you might not love it, <laughs> but can you live with it? And I think for right now, I can definitely live with it. And I just am grateful for the um, flexibility and the thoughtfulness that went into it and into all the, all the various amendments in this final product or close to final product, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Lehman. And yeah, I will never, uh, you will never need to ask to be excused to praise me in this subcommittee. That's actually always on the menu and always on the agenda. I appreciate the, the three shout outs. But like I said, this was a lot of work from Ben, from our chair, 
from the administration, from DHCD. This was definitely a team effort. And I think this is something that whether you vote green or red, I think we can all be proud of as a subcommittee. All right, seeing no other, no other comments, um, let's take a vote. All those in favor of the bill as amended HB 538, raise your hand or signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right, Delegate Rocky is opposed, but the bill will receive a favorable with amendments report from the Land Use and Ethics Subcommittee. Any other comments for the good of the order but before we adjourn? Seeing none, great work again, everyone. I will see y'all.